This is an NBC News special report. Here's Chuck Todd. Good morning. We are awaiting a statement on this Sunday morning from President Trump at any moment from the diplomatic room in the White House. The president is expected to announce that a U.S.-led special operations mission killed the world's most wanted terrorist, the leader of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. The raid happening in northern Syria on Saturday. Several other people were also killed. President Trump tweeting on Saturday night, quote, something very big has just happened. Let's begin with NBC's chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, who is in northern Syria with details of the, uh, the raid. Richard, good morning. How convinced are we that we have al-Baghdadi? Well, U.S. officials are pretty convinced. Uh, they are not giving the 100 percent confirmation. We might hear, hear that soon from President Trump, but they are very confident that this overnight raid, which began around 11 o'clock local time, did in fact kill Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS, the world's most wanted terrorist. It happened, according to multiple witnesses, in a small village, a small village right on the Syrian-Turkish border, a village that we've been to, I've been to uh, about a half Half dozen times. It was a well known smuggling village, so it is possible Baghdadi, who's been on the run for years now, was trying to leave Syria, perhaps go to Turkey, stay in this area that has an open flow of people. Now, witnesses in the village tell us this is what happened. Around 11 o'clock, first they heard helicopters come in, U.S. Special Operations Forces. The helicopters came in in force. They were circling, they were opening fire. This was not a quick operation, it was not an in and out. They were circling and firing for quite a bit of time, the whole thing lasting three to four hours. Then American troops landing. They didn't just attack one target. They, they targeted multiple houses and a car in the area. They mo the main focus, however, was that what they think was the hideout of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. They went inside. There was gunshots. Uh, the witness that we spoke to was about 500 yards away. He said he could hear the helicopters over his home. He could feel the wind from the uh, helicopter blades pushing into his house, rattling the windows. But he said he wasn't able to go outside. What happened in that house, it's, it's quite unclear. But uh, this operation continued to unfold. The U.S. Special Operations Forces, the most elite American troops in the world, were on the ground exploiting, as they call it, this site, gathering information, apparently killing Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and then leaving and blowing up the compound. Richard Engel uh, in northern Syria's forest. Let me check in with Hallie Jackson at the White House. And Hallie, we saw President Trump last night uh, seemed to tease this out of what happened. When do we know when this raid was uh, greenlit by the president? Yeah, in the evening at some point, Chuck, as this was going down, we understand from multiple sources familiar with the matter that the president himself personally approved this operation. I'm told that there were a lot of top White House aides who were huddled here at the White House late into the evening with one source telling me this morning that President Trump and a small group of his advisors were in the Situation Room monitoring developments with this operation. The president, of course, very involved in this. What is a critical moment for him moving forward? When you look at this, Chuck, the president has repeatedly repeatedly talked about what he has described the defeat of ISIS. This is something that has become almost a part of his campaign stump speech, if you will. It's referenced constantly when the president makes public remarks, but he has talked much less, far fewer times, about al-Baghdadi himself. At this point, the president has mentioned, for example, Baghdadi's short detention in 2004 rather critically, and I expect that today, Chuck, when you think about the backdrop of this, remember, this is coming now, this operation at a time where the president's critics are questioning his Syria policy, and that includes critics inside his own party after the president pulled most U.S. troops out of the region. Watch for the president, based on my reporting and what I've heard to talk about how this is essentially proof positive that his position is working. This, I don't know if we want to call it a victory lap at this point because I'm not sure right. how definitive it'll be that the president will declare that Baghdadi has in fact been killed. Uh, but I do think that the president will use this as a way to try to convince the American people that his position is correct on Syria, that what he wants to do is working in the campaign to defeat ISIS. It's certainly a commander in chief moment for him. It's an unusual time, as you know, for a president to be making these kinds of public remarks on a Sunday morning, but clearly the president, after this operation went down, we understand late yesterday, wanted to get out there and wanted to, to be the first public presence talking about this, Chuck. 
Uh, Hallie Jackson at the White House, thank you. Let me go to our Pentagon correspondent, Courtney Cube, Cuby, who is in Erbil, Iraq. And Courtney, uh, it was interesting to see the uh, head of the uh, Syrian Defense Forces, General Mazloum, he had a lot of, he took some credit, uh, number one, uh, but he also handed out yeah. a lot of credit and said this has been a five-month operation, if you will, to track and locate mm -hmm. al-Baghdadi. Yeah, there's a couple of people of different nations who are taking credit for this right now. What we know from the U.S. military side is that these elite special operators who were part of this mission arrived in the country a little over a week ago here in the region, and they started planning, refining their plans for this mission. They had received some actionable intelligence, and they wanted to refine it before they actually went forward, got the approval, and went forward with this mission. We have a little bit of new details about exactly what happened. We know now that at least some of those forces launched launched from right here in Erbil and flew into northwestern Syria, right near the border with Turkey. Uh, we also know now that when those commandos, these Delta Force commandos, when they landed on the ground and they started this raid, they were met with some resistance. ISIS deploying at least one car or vehicle uh, bomb to try to stop the raid, which was taken out by a U.S. airstrike. So we know that this mission, this raid, lasted several hours. It was an extended period, but much of that time was actually used for the site exploitation. So that's them going in, trying to gather up uh, computers, files, anything they can get. We also know that as, as part of the exploitation, they will try to get DNA or any kind of forensic evidence that they can on the target, in this case, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, so that when we get to the, uh, a later stage, when this uh, raid like this becomes public, they can talk to the American people and to the world with more certainty that, in fact, Baghdadi may be the person who was targeted and killed in this operation, Chuck. Courtney Cuby in Erbil, Iraq, for us right now. Courtney, thanks very much. Let me go to our chief foreign affairs correspondent, Andrea Mitchell. And Andrea, I understand you've gotten word that the president has already been making some phone calls this morning uh, to some Americans who are, I think are going to be quite happy to hear that al-Baghdadi might be dead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Diane Foley, of course, the Foley's, the first victim of ISIS, the first American victim of ISIS, and these high-profile cases where the president was very engaged in really intensifying what was done, has been done about hostages of terrorists. So those families are going to be very much part of this speech, I believe. In addition, um, we believe that they are very very confident in that they, they've got the, uh, the forensics from the ground and that we're going to hear a lot more about that in the speech about Baghdadi's identification. The other thing about this is the president has been misstating for many, many months that ISIS is conquered. Uh, in contrast to an inspector general's report from the Pentagon, they did get rid of the caliphate, the territory, but ISIS was resurgent, according to the Pentagon's own independent inspector general, uh, in July, at the end of June, resurgent in both Syria and Iraq. And so it is significant that this uh, at least is a symbolic victory and that Baghdadi may have more of an, may have had or was going to have more of an operational role given where he was found than many uh, people had believed in U.S. intelligence. So this is clearly going to be a big victory round for the president and they're making the most of it, of course, with this speech this morning. All right, Andrea Mitchell, uh, uh, thank you very much. Let me go to Jeremy Bash. He's the former chief of staff both at the CIA and the Pentagon during the Obama administration. And he's also an NBC News national security analyst. So, Jeremy, this morning, is this a, a, a al-Baghdadi uh, symbolic leader, operational leader? Uh, how much was he at this point of ISIS? Well, he led from the shadows, and he really was a symbolic leader. He didn't appear very much in public, and it's unclear whether he had command and control authority over ISIS elements. ISIS became a franchise, Chuck. It inspired attacks across Europe, even some in the United States and around the world in Sri Lanka, etc. Al-Baghdadi wasn't necessarily directing that, but a, a, taking him down is an important, it's an, a momentous uh, opportunity to really uh, emphasize that the caliphate it, uh, it needs to be defeated. It has been under pressure. But with the decision in recent weeks by Trump to allow Turkey to go into northern Syria, the Kurdish force, our allies on the ground, have had to abandon their, their, their takedowns of ISIS and guarding of ISIS prisons. And that has allowed uh, ISIS fighters to be released from prison. So that's a concern, Chuck. We're going to have to watch that in the days and weeks to come. Jeremy Bash, uh, thank you. Let me go back to Richard Engel in northern Syria. And so, Richard, on the same issue of sort of 
Where are we operationally on ISIS? How important is, is the, the public notification of the death of al-Baghdadi? How much could that impact ISIS's abilities, just simply whether it is on the inspiration front or when it comes to operational abilities? It is important. He was the leader of the group. He was the symbol of the group. He was the founder of the group. Uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, in many ways, is on the same level of Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden did 9-11, and that, in the world of extremists, made him a hero. And then U.S. Uh, Special Operations Forces, in that case Navy SEALs, hunted him down and found him. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi did something very different, in some ways more impactful globally. He didn't just found a terrorist organization. He established a terror state where I am right now, a terror state that he called the Caliphate. And that state has been under attack with U.S. Special Forces, with Kurdish allies for the last five years. So this is a culmination of a five-year war against ISIS that the Kurds helped a great deal with. They lost 11,000 of their people to get to this moment. And now they say, because the U President Trump is shifting Middle East policy, that they are going to be left behind. That's why they have been so angry. That's why over the last several days, we've been doing so many reports about how the Kurds feel betrayed. They are under attack. And it is because of the five years of hunting down ISIS, looking for Baghdadi, gathering intelligence, culminating with this moment, tracking him down to a safe house in a little tiny Syrian border village, a smuggling town, that they were able to execute this raid. American special ops going in, killing him, right. exploiting the, uh, the facility for intelligence, and then leaving. And this won't be just the end right now. Whenever they go onto a target like this, like they did with bin Laden, they look for everything they could find, any kind of computers, documents, files, and then they act immediately because that intelligence is fresh. It is what they call actionable. So this is not just one operation. There are probably going to be follow-on operations in the, in the coming hours and days. You, uh, Richard, you had made a mention in one of the reporting notes this morning that we were all uh, exchanging uh, that, uh, look, this was actually an al-Qaeda uh, area, sort of an al-Qaeda controlled area or former remnants of al-Qaeda and that there were some times that, that al-Qaeda or the remnants of it and, and ISIS were at odds on here. What does that tell you that he was almost seeking uh, refuge with al-Qaeda? But it didn't work, did it? So no. <laughs> it, you could look at this as a, a, as a great intelligence coup, uh, but it also could be that this was a bit of an internal hit. Somebody turned him in. And I, uh, Al Qaeda never liked ISIS. ISIS was too violent for Al Qaeda. They never liked Baghdadi. Baghdadi brought a different kind of terrorism to, uh, to, to the world. He would butcher his victims, he would cut their heads off, he would set them on fire. ISIS, uh, Al Qaeda, never liked him. They thought he was too, too violent, too radical, too uncontrollable. And the fact that he went back on the run as his caliphate was shrinking to an Al Qaeda area and then suddenly is picked up. And by the way, they were, uh, they were on the ground, according to witnesses, an Arabic speaker as part of this operation, using a bullhorn, asking for a specific person to turn himself in. So there was a specific source that they were looking for to say, please turn yourself in. They didn't want to kill him. So they had some cooperation from the ground in this Al Qaeda area. So you could look at it as well as a bit of a, a mafia hit. The, uh, the larger organization, the, lo the one with the longer term vision, turning on someone, a, a group that was too radical, causing too much problems and, and too extreme even for them. All right, Richard Engel in northern Syria. Let me go back to Courtney Kuby in uh, Erbil, uh, Iraq for us. And Courtney, um, have we captured any, do we know yet if we've captured anybody alive or, or are the bodies that we've taken are all deceased at this point? So there have been some local rumors and reporting of that, but there's nothing official that the U.S. took anyone into custody on this. The, the, when you have, remember back to the Abbottabad raid with Osama bin Laden, there were all kinds of rumors swirling around about what exactly happened there. We're seeing the same thing here. 
one of the issues is we're going to get very little fidelity out of the U.S. military about this because of the very classified and special operations nature of this mission with the Delta Force. These are the most elite and the most secretive of the U.S. military forces, and we don't tend to hear very much about them. But given the fact that this is such a high-profile person who was, seems to have been killed in this raid, we may get a little bit more detail than usual. We do know that the military who was there exploiting the site was able to gather some DNA from the person who they believe to be Baghdadi. We know that, uh, according to no a number of U.S. officials, that, in fact, he detonated a suicide vest or a belt. It's not uncommon for people, for, for those kinds of terrorist leaders or ISIS cell leaders to be wearing a, a vest or a belt, we don't often see them actually detonate them. In this, so in this case, that was a little bit surprising. Uh, there was even some back and forth early on over whether he detonated himself or maybe during the course of the firefight, somehow it exploded. But U.S. officials are now, are now confirming that to us. In the course of then them, the U.S. military going through the site and gathering up any intelligence, what, you know, as Richard called the actionable intelligence, during the course of that time, they were able to gather DNA. And that's why officials now seem so confident in the finding that, in fact, if, if, that we expect to hear from President Trump that, in fact, Baghdadi has been killed in this raid. Uh, Courtney Cuby in Iraq, uh, thank you. Let me go to Andrea Mitchell. And, Andrea, uh, there, the way Washington works, there's almost going to be a competing sort of um, I told you so's, I, fe I feel as if, in this debate about what should the American presence be in northern Syria? What should the presence be long-term, short-term, mid-term, right? And you're going to have some that argue that say the presence there is necessary in order to strike like we struck to get al-Baghdadi and other, and then perhaps the president and some of his allies may argue, um, we're ma this is the progress that we're making, which makes me confident in the decisions that I've made. Um, where's this debate going to go in Washington, particularly inside the Trump administration, Andrea? It's going to go right to the 2020 campaign, I suspect. Uh, look, the fact is that it's the Syrian Kurds, most likely, to their credit, were helpful in this operation, and Turkey was not. Turkey was only engaged to deconflict, to let them know, don't shoot at us, we're crossing this, this border. They were not at all involved operationally, as far as we know, from even what the Turks have said today. So this, this raises the question, why did we abandon the Syrian Kurds who were our allies, who were keeping the ISIS fighters under lock and key, and go with Erdogan and Turkey when they have not been helpful to us and, in fact, make the situation that much more com uh, complicated. We need to be on the ground to have this kind of intelligence, and you could almost argue that we were getting this intelligence now because we're at that critical point where all U.S. troops were going to be out except those in a completely different area guarding the oil and those were, were not the people who were looking for ISIS fighters. Uh, I think there's going to be a very tough debate about this. We know that there's going to be a victory lap today from the president, and that is appropriate. This is a big deal. But the fact is there's going to be arguments over how important Baghdadi was to, you know, what Jeremy just described as a franchise operation. They are in Libya. They are in other parts of Africa. They are in the Philippines. ISIS is now a brand, and a hideous brand, and they had their own enemies, as Richard just pointed out, among the al-Qaeda rivals. So this, is, this story is not yet told. I am told that the operation, that options were presented to the president on Thursday, that he authorized the ground operation on Thursday. So this did come together very quickly, uh, as the bin Laden operation did once they decided to go forward. Uh, Andrea Mitchell, thanks for that Addition, we're, additional info. I feel like we're, we're, we continue to get pieces of this put together. Let me go back to Jeremy Bash here for a second. As you just heard from Andrea there, that we, it, that this was greenlit as late as Thursday. So on one hand, some planning, but this came together fairly quickly. You're familiar with how these decisions uh, come together this quickly. Explain how we could go from some intelligence to operations that fast and apparently we're going to hear from the president in about a minute so jeremy that's your time limit here yeah quickly here <clears throat> look president obama in 2011 greenlit the operation against bin laden three days before the operation but it was many weeks and months in the making and he was briefed so we need more information about how the white house was involved but i think the broader issue here is chuck is that 
We don't know what this means for the future of ISIS. ISIS is in transition. Yes, the, the, their leadership has been decapitated, but because they are now in some ways in ascendance, because the Kurdish force on the ground, which was containing them, has been have to splinter in the face of this Turkey invasion, we don't know whether that means that ISIS will be stronger in the weeks and months to come or whether or not they'll be weaker. So does this mean very quickly, Jeremy, that, um, well, I'm going to uh, pause it there, and here's the president. Last night, the United States brought the world's number one terrorist leader to justice, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, is dead. He was the founder and leader of ISIS, the most ruthless and violent terror organization anywhere in the world. The United States has been searching for Baghdadi for many years. Capturing or killing Baghdadi has been the top national security priority of my administration. U.S. Special Operations Forces executed a dangerous and daring nighttime raid in northwestern Syria and accomplished their mission in grand style. The U.S. personnel were incredible. I got to watch much of it. No personnel were lost in the operation, while a large number of Baghdadi's fighters and companions were killed with him. He died after running into a dead-end tunnel, whimpering and crying and screaming all the way. The compound had been cleared by this time, with people either surrendering or being shot and killed. Eleven young children were moved out of the house and are uninjured. The only ones remaining were Baghdadi in the tunnel, and he had dragged three of his young children with him. They were led to certain death. He reached the end of the tunnel as our dogs chased him down. He ignited his vest, killing himself and the three children. His body was mutilated by the blast. The tunnel had caved in on it, in addition. But test results gave certain immediate and totally positive identification. It was him. The thug who tried so hard to intimidate others spent his last moments in utter fear, in total panic and dread, terrified of the American forces bearing down on him. We were in the compound for approximately two hours, and after the mission was accomplished, we took highly sensitive material and information from the raid, much having to do with ISIS, origins, future plans, things that we very much want. Baghdadi's demise demonstrates America's relentless pursuit of terrorist leaders and our commitment to the enduring and total defeat of ISIS and other terrorist organizations. Our reach is very long. As you know, last month we announced that we recently killed Hamza bin Laden, the very violent son of Osama bin Laden, who was saying very bad things about people, about our country, about the world. He was the heir apparent to al-Qaeda, terrorists who oppress and murder innocent people should never sleep soundly, knowing that we will completely destroy them. These savage monsters will not escape their fate, and they will not escape the final judgment of God. Baghdadi has been on the run for many years, long before I took office. But at my direction, 
as Commander-in-Chief of the United States, we obliterated his caliphate 100 percent in March of this year. Today's events are another reminder that we will continue to pursue the remaining ISIS terrorists to their brutal end. That also goes for other terrorist organizations. They are likewise in our sights. Baghdadi and the losers who worked for him, and losers they are, they had no idea what they were getting into. In some cases, they were very frightened puppies. In other cases, they were hardcore killers. But they killed many, many people. Their murder of innocent Americans, James Foley, Stephen Sotloff, Peter Kasich, and Kayla Mueller were especially heinous. The shocking publicized murder of Jordanian pilot, a wonderful young man, spoke to the King of Jordan. They all knew him. They all loved him. He was burned alive in a cage for all to see on the execution of Christians in Libya and Egypt, as well as the genocidal mass murder of Yazidis, rank ISIS among the most depraved organizations, the history of our world. The forced religious conversions, the orange suits prior to so many beheadings, all of which were openly displayed for the world to see. This was all that Abu Bakr al baghdadi this is what he wanted. This is what he was proud of. He was a sick and depraved man, and now he's gone. Baghdadi was vicious and violent, and he died in a vicious and violent way as a coward running and crying. This raid was impeccable and could only have taken place with the acknowledgement and help of certain other nations and people. I want to thank the nations of Russia, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, and I also want to thank the Syrian Kurds for certain support they were able to give us. This was a very, very dangerous mission. Thank you as well to the great intelligence professionals who helped make this very successful journey possible. I want to thank the soldiers and sailors, airmen and Marines involved in last night's operation. You are the very best there is anywhere in the world. No matter where you go, there is nobody even close. I want to thank General Mark Milley and our Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I also want to thank our professionals who work in other agencies of the United States government and were critical to the mission's unbelievable success. Last night was a great night for the United States and for the world. A brutal killer, one who has caused so much hardship and death, has violently been eliminated. He will never again harm another innocent man, woman, or child. He died like a dog. He died like a coward. The world is now a much safer place. God bless America. Thank you. Any questions? When did you first hear about that this was an operation that was going to get started? We've had him under surveillance for a couple of weeks. We knew a little bit about where he was going, where he was heading. Uh, we had very good information that he was going to another location. He didn't go. Two or three efforts were canceled because he decided to change his mind, constantly changing his mind. And finally, we saw that he was here, held up here. We knew something about the compound. We knew it had tunnels. 
Uh, the tunnels were dead end for the most part. There was one we think that wasn't, but we had that covered too, just in case. Uh, the level of intelligence, the level of work was, was pretty amazing. Um, when we landed with eight helicopters, a large crew of brilliant fighters ran out of those helicopters and blew holes into the side of the building, not wanting to go through the main door because that was booby-trapped. And uh, there was uh, something — it was something really amazing to see. I got to watch it, along with uh, General Milley, Vice President Pence, others, uh, in the Situation Room. And we watched it uh, so clearly. How did you — how did you watch this? Well, I don't want to say how, but we had absolutely perfect — as though you were watching a movie. It was uh, — that that and the technology there alone is, is really great. Uh, a big part of the trip that was of great danger was the uh, — it was approximately an hour and 10-minute flight, and we were flying over very, very uh, dangerous territory. In fact, uh, some of our leaders said that that could be the most dangerous, flying in and flying out. And that's why last night we were so quiet about it. We didn't say anything. And I didn't make my remark until after they had landed safely in a certain area. But the, uh, the flight in, the flight out, was uh, a very, very dangerous part. There was a chance that we would have met unbelievable fire. Uh, Russia treated us great. They opened up. We had to fly over certain Russia areas, Russia-held areas. Russia was great. Uh, Iraq was excellent. We really had a great cooperation. And you have to understand, they didn't know what we were doing and where we were going exactly. But uh, the ISIS fighters are hated as much by Russia and some of these other countries as they are by us. Uh, and that's why I say they should start doing a lot of the fighting now, and they'll be able to. I really believe they'll be able to. Yes, Jennifer? Can you say what role the Kurds played in this, just generally? Uh, they gave us not a, a military role at all, but they gave us some information that turned out to be helpful. The Kurds. And can you tell us what the role of Turkey might have been in Iraq? Who? What was the role of Turkey? How did they help? Uh, Turkey, we dealt with them. They know we were going in. Uh, we flew over some territory. Uh, they were terrific, no problem. They were not problem. You know, they could start shooting, and then we will take them out. But a lot of bad things can happen. Uh, plus, it was a very secret mission. We flew very, very low and very, very fast. But it was a big — it was a very dangerous part of the mission. Uh, getting in and getting out, too, equal. We went in, in identical uh, — we took an identical route. We met with gunfire coming in, uh, but it was local gunfire. That gunfire was immediately terminated. These people are amazing. They had the, the gunfire terminated immediately, meaning they were shot from the airships. I'm trying to understand the timing. Uh, you talked earlier, you know, several weeks about pulling troops out, you know, and then the troops were put back in. And, then, you know, I'm trying to understand the timing of when this operation Well, I, I tell you, from the first day I came to office, and now we're getting close to three years, I would say, Where's al-Baghdadi? I want al-Baghdadi. And we would kill terrorist leaders, but they were names I never heard of. They were names that weren't recognizable, and they weren't the big names. Some good ones, some important ones, but they weren't the big names. I kept saying, where's al-Baghdadi? And a couple of weeks ago, they were able to scope him out. You know, these people are very smart. They're not into the use of cell phones anymore. They're not — they're very technically brilliant. You know, they use the Internet better than almost anybody in the world, perhaps other than Donald Trump. But they use the Internet incredibly well. And what they've done with the Internet through recruiting and everything — and that's why he died like a dog. He died like a coward. He was whimpering, screaming, and crying. And frankly, I think it's something that should be brought out so that his followers and all of these young kids that want to leave various countries, including the United States, they should see how he died. He didn't die a hero. He died a coward. 
crying, whimpering, screaming, and bringing three kids with him to die. A certain death. And he knew the tunnel had no end. I mean, it was a, uh, it was a closed, closed end. They call it a closed end tunnel. Not a good place to be. Was going on before you made the announcement that you're I've been home. looking for him for three years. I've been looking for him. I started getting some very positive feedback about a month ago. And uh, we had some incredible intelligence officials that did a great job. That's what they should be focused on. And, and about what time did this operation start yesterday, sir? And, and did, have you notified? Well, this operation you? started two weeks ago in terms of the real operation because we had him scoped. Uh, we thought he'd be in a certain location. He was. Things started checking out very well. Uh, we were involved in, on our own team with some brilliant people who I've gotten to know, brilliant people that love our country, highly intelligent people. And uh, we, uh, we've had it uh, pretty well scoped out for a couple of weeks. But he tends to change immediately. He had a lot of cash. He tends to change, like, on a dime, where he'll be going to a certain location, all of a sudden he'll go someplace else, and you'll have to cancel. But this was one where we knew he was there, and you can never be 100 percent sure because you're basing it on technology more than anything else. But we thought he was there, and then we got a confirmation. And when we went in, uh, they were greeted with a lot of firepower, a lot of firepower. I'll tell you, these guys, they do a job. They are so brave and so good. And so importantly, many of his people were killed. Um, and we'll announce the exact number over the next uh, 24 hours. But many were killed. Uh, we lost nobody. Think of that. It's incredible. And when you, when you told the Russians, you requested Our dog was hurt, Russians. actually. The, the canine was uh, hurt, went into the tunnel. But we lost nobody. So you requested the, to the Russians to fly over this area they controlled. What did you tell them? We spoke them? to the Russians. What did you tell them? You we told them we're coming in. Okay. And they said, thank you for telling us. They were very good. But did you tell them why? You know, no. No. Uh, they did not know why. Was any other uh, We did tell them, we think you're going to be very happy. Because, you know, again, they hate ISIS as much as we do. You know what ISIS has done to Russia. So, uh, no, we did not tell. They did not know the mission, but they knew we were going over an area that they had uh, — they had a lot of firepower. And, and have you notified the congressional leaders <coughs> about this? Pelosi uh, — We've notified Trump some. Model. Others are being notified now as I speak. Uh, we were going to notify him last night, but we decided not to do that because Washington leaks like I've never seen before. There's nothing — there's no country in the world that leaks w like we do. And Washington is a leaking machine. And I told my people we will not notify them until uh, the — our great people are out. Not just in, but out. I don't want to have them greeted with — uh, firepower like you wouldn't believe. So we were able to get in. It was top secret. It was kept. There were no leaks, no nothing. The only people that knew were the few people that I dealt with. And again, Mark Milley and the Joint Chiefs of Staff were incredible. Uh, we had some tremendous backup. Robert O'Brien, Secretary Esper, Secretary Pompeo. Pence, I told you, he was great. We — this is a very small group of people that knew about this. We had very, very few people. We — a leak — a leak could have caused the death of all of them. Now, they're so good that I think nothing was going to stop them anyway. You want to know the truth. That's how good they were. We had them also surrounded by massive uh, air power up in the air yesterday, surrounded at very high levels. We were very low. Uh, we had tremendous air power. I saw this from the sit room. Who, who were you with in the sit room when you watched this? Uh, Secretary uh, Esper, a few of the Joint Chiefs, Mark Milley, uh, some generals. We had some very great uh, military people in that room. And we had some great intelligence people. Robert O'Brien. It's really good.
Yes. Yes. Was the pullout of the U.S. troops in Syria last month strategically tied in was with this raid? Was no, it, no. The pullout. Raid? Right. Sure. It's a great question, and you're doing a great job, by the way. Your network is fantastic. They're really doing a great job. Please let them know. Um, no, the the pullout had nothing to do with this. In fact, uh, we found this out a, at a similar time. It's a very good question, because we found this out at a similar time. No, we're after these leaders, and we have others in sight, very bad ones, but this was the big one. This is the biggest one, uh, perhaps, uh, that we've ever captured, because this is the one that built ISIS and beyond, and was looking to rebuild it again. Very, very strongly looking to build it again. That's why he went to this province. This is why he went to this area. You know, a lot of people I was watching uh, this morning and hearing, and they said, why was he there? People were so surprised. Well, that's where he was trying to rebuild from, because that was the place that made most sense, if you're looking to rebuild. Yeah. You said uh, your tweet last night. At what moment did you decide to send that? So I said that right after I knew they had landed safely. When they had returned? Right. And that was to notify you guys that you have something big this morning so you wouldn't be out playing golf okay. or tennis where was, or, where did they or land? otherwise being indisposed. Where were they safe? Where did they, where did they land it? I'd rather not say. But we landed in a very friendly port in a friendly country. Um, give you any pause about your decision to withdraw? No, I think it, it's great. Look, we don't want to keep soldiers between Syria and Turkey for the next 200 years. They've been fighting for hundreds of years. We're out. But we are leaving soldiers to secure the oil. Now, we may have to fight for the oil. It's okay. Maybe somebody else wants the oil, in which case they have a hell of a fight. But there's massive amounts of oil, and we're securing it for a couple of reasons. Number one, it stops ISIS, because ISIS got tremendous wealth from that oil. We have taken it. It's secured. Number two, and again, somebody else may claim it, but either we'll negotiate a deal with whoever's claiming it, if we think it's fair, or we will militarily stop them very quickly. We have tremendous power in that part of the world. We have, uh, you know, the airport is right nearby, a very big, very monstrous, very, uh, very powerful airport and very expensive airport that was built years ago. We're in there for, we're in that Middle East now for, Eight trillion dollars. So we don't want to be keeping Syria and Turkey. They're going to have to make their own decision. The Kurds have worked along incredibly with us. But in all fairness, it was much easier dealing with the Kurds after they went through three days of fighting, because that was a brutal three days. And if I, we would have said to the Kurds, hey, do you mind moving over seven miles? Because, you know, they were in the middle, mostly. So you'd have seven or eight miles. Could you mind moving over? Because I have to say, Turkey has taken tremendous deaths from that part of the world. You know, we call it a safe zone, but it was anything but a safe zone. Turkey has lost thousands and thousands of people from that safe zone. So they've always wanted that safe zone for many years. I'm glad I was able to help them get it. But we don't want to be there. We want to be home. I want our soldiers home or fighting something that's meaningful. I'll tell you who loves us being there, Russia and China. Because while they build their military, we're depleting our military there. So Russia loves us being there. Now, Russia likes us being there for two reasons. Because we kill ISIS, we kill terrorists, and they're very close to Russia. We're 8,000 miles away. Now, maybe they can get here, but we've done very well with Homeland Security and the ban which, by the way, is approved by the United States Supreme Court, as you know. You know, there was a reporter that said, we lost the case, and he was right in the early court. He refused, he didn't want to say, just refused to say that we won the case in the Supreme Court. So, you know, but we have a very effective ban, and it's very hard for people to come to our country. But it's many thousands of miles away, whereas Russia's right there, Turkey's right there, Syria is there. They're all right there. Excuse me, Iran is right there, Iraq is right there. They all hate ISIS. So we don't, you know, in theory, they should do something. And I'll give you something else. The European nations have been a tremendous disappointment. Because I personally called, but my people called a lot, take your ISIS fighters. And they didn't want them. They said, we don't want them. They came from France. They came from Germany. They came from the UK. 
They came from a lot of countries. And I actually said to them, you don't take them, I'm going to drop them right on your border. And you can have fun capturing them again. But the United States taxpayer is not going to pay for the next 50 years. You see what Guantanamo costs. We're not going to pay tens of billions of dollars because we were good enough to capture people that want to go back to Germany, France, UK, and other parts of Europe. And they can walk back. They can't walk to our country. We have lots of water in between our country and them. So, yeah, go. You, you mentioned that you'd met some, gotten to know some brilliant people along this process who had helped uh, provide information and, 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 and advice along the way. Is there anyone in particular, or would you like to give anyone credit for uh, getting to this point today? Well, I, I would, but if I mention one, I have to mention so many. I spoke to Senator Richard Burr this morning. And as you know, he's very involved with intelligence and the committee. And he's a great gentleman. Uh, I spoke with Lindsey Graham just a little while ago. In fact, Lindsey Graham is right over here. And he's been very much involved in the subject. And he's, uh, he's a very strong hawk. But I think Lindsey agrees with what we're doing now. And uh, again, there are plenty of other countries that can help them patrol. I don't want to leave 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 soldiers on the border. But where Lindsey and I totally agree is the oil. The oil is, uh, you know, so valuable for many reasons. It fueled ISIS, number one. Number two, it helps the Kurds, because it's basically been taken away from the Kurds. They were able to live with that oil. And number three, it can help us, because we should be able to take some also. And what I intend to do, perhaps, is make a deal with an Exxon Mobil or one of our great companies to go in there and do it properly. Right now, it's not big. It's big oil underground, but it's not big oil up top. Much of the machinery has been shot and dead. It's been through wars, but uh, and and spread out the wealth. But no, we're protecting the oil. We're securing the oil. Now that doesn't mean we don't make a deal at some point. But I don't want to be. They're they're fighting for a thousand years. They're fighting for centuries. I want to bring our soldiers back home, but I do want to secure the oil. If you read about the history of Donald Trump, I was a civilian. I had absolutely nothing to do with going into Iraq, and I was totally against it. But I always used to say, if they're going to go in, nobody cared that much, but it got written about. If they're going to go in, I'm sure you've heard the statement, because I met him when any human being alive. If they're going into Iraq, keep the oil. They never did. They never did. I know Lindsey Graham had a bill where basically we would have been paid back for all of the billions of dollars that we've spent, many, many billions of dollars. I mean, I hate to say it. It's actually trillions of dollars, but many, many billions of dollars. And uh, by one vote, they were unable to get that approved in the Senate. They had some pretty big opposition from people that shouldn't have opposed, like a president, and they weren't able. If you did that, Iraq would be a much different story today, because they would be owing us a lot of money. They would be treating us much differently. But I will say, Iraq was very good with respect to the raid last night. Sir, just, to, just to pin down the timing a little bit better here, you got back to the White House around 4.30 yesterday afternoon. Did you immediately go to the Situation Room? Well, I knew all about this for three days. Yes, sir. Yeah, we, we thought for three days this is what was going to happen. It was actually, look, nobody was even hurt. Our canine, as they call, I call it a dog, a beautiful dog, a talented dog, was injured and brought back. But uh, we had no soldier injured. And they did a lot of shooting, and they did a lot of blasting, even not going through the front door. You know, you think you go through the door. If you're a normal person, you say, knock, knock, may I come in? Uh, the fact is that they blasted their way into uh, the house in a very heavy wall, and it took them literally seconds. By the time those things went off, they had a beautiful big hole, and they ran in, and they got everybody by surprise. Unbe unbelievably brilliant as fighters. I don't — I can't imagine there could be anybody better. And these, as you know, are our top operations people. Baghdadi apparently had been in bad health for some time. Were, was there any indication of that? Or that well, we don't know that, but he was the last one out, and his people had either been killed, which there were many, or gave up. 
and came out, uh, because with the 11 children that came out, we were able to do that. Uh, we don't know if they were his children. They might have been. But as I said, three died in the tunnel. And the tunnel collapsed with the explosion. But, uh, but you had other fighters coming out also. And they're being brought back. Uh, they're being — they're — right now, uh, we have them imprisoned. I was going to ask whose children they were, but do you remember what time you went into the Situation Room? Well, I started at 5 o'clock. We were pretty much gathered at 5 o'clock yesterday. Uh, we were in contact all day long through uh, hopefully secure phones. I'll let you know tomorrow. But nothing seemed to leak, so I guess they were secure for a change. Uh, but uh, we gathered more or less at 5. Uh, the attack started moments after that. The, the liftoff started moments after that. Again, the, the element of attack that they were most afraid of was getting from our base into that compound, because there's tremendous firepower that we were, you know, flying over. Uh, and I won't go into it, but you had a very big Russian presence in one area. You had a Turkish presence. You had a Syrian presence. And you're flying low. It's very dangerous. And there were shots made, but we think these were people that were shooting, that were indiscriminately shooting. The helicopters took some shots, but we think that these were people that were just random people that don't like to see helicopters, I guess. Have you been yet? Was there, was there any kind of DNA test done? Or, or so that's another part of, of the genius of these people. They brought his — they have his DNA, more of it than they want, even. And they brought it with them, with lab technicians who were with them. And they assumed that this was Baghdadi. They thought visually it was him, uh, but they assumed it was him. And uh, they did a site, an on-site test. They got samples. And to get to his body, they had to remove a lot of debris because the tunnel had collapsed. But these people are very good at that. And uh, and they, as I said, they brought body parts back with them, et cetera, et cetera. There wasn't much left. The uh, the uh, the vest blew up, but uh, there are still substantial pieces that they they brought back. So they did an on-site test because we had to know this, and it was uh, a very quick call that took place about 15 minutes after he was killed, and it was positive. It was. It's — this is a confirmation, sir. There was also a report that his wife — there was also a report that his wife had detonated — or one of his wives had detonated a vessel. So there were two women. There were two women, uh, both wives, both wearing vests. They had not detonated, but the fact that they were dead and they had vests on made it very difficult for our men, because they had vests on. And it made it very difficult for our men. Uh, because you never know what's going to happen. They're lying. They're dead. They never detonated, but they were dead. On uh, the successor, the possible successors, have you been briefed on who? Yeah, we know the themselves? successors, and we've already got them in our sights, and we'll tell you uh, that right now. But we know the successors. Uh, Hamza bin Laden was a big thing, but this is the biggest there is. This is uh, the worst ever. Uh, Osama bin Laden was very big, but Osama bin Laden became big with the World Trade Center. This is a man who built a whole, uh, as he would like to call it, a country, a caliphate, uh, and was trying to do it again. And uh, I had not heard too much about his health. I've heard stories about he may not have been in good health, but he died, a, a, he died in a, a ruthless, a vicious manner that I can were tell you. Prisoners taken, sir? Were there any adults taken? For yes, we have uh, people that were taken. Uh, we have uh, many of the people died on the site, but we have people that were taken. Yes, and and the children, uh, we are, we left them under care of somebody that we understand. Many, or do you believe that these eleven were children? All, eleven children. How many adults? Uh, I'd rather not say. I'd leave that to the generals. But a, a small group, uh, more dead than alive. Which operations teams were involved? Which, which special operations teams were involved? Uh, many of them, and at the top level, and people that were 
truly incredible at their craft. I've never seen anything like it. And were there, as far as partnerships goes, were there any other uh, forces involved, or was this only American troops? No, in this only region? American forces. Did, was, did the U.S. only American forces? But we were given great cooperation. Did the U.S. rely? We on told the Russians were coming in because we had to go over them, and they were curious. But but uh, we said we're coming. Or, uh, and we said one way or the other. Hey, you look, we're coming. But they were very cooperative. They really were good. And, and we did say it would be a mission that they'd like, too, because, you know, again, they hate ISIS as much as we do. Sure, and then for uh, intel purposes, was there, any, was there any foreign intel that proved useful along the way uh, in this operation? So we had uh, our own intel. We got very little help. We didn't need very much help. We have some incredible people. When we use our intelligence correctly, what we can do is incredible. When we waste our time with intelligence that hurts our country, because we had poor leadership at the top, that's not good. But I've gotten to know many of the intel people, and I will say that they are spectacular. Now, they're not going to want to talk about it. They want to keep it quiet, the last thing they want, because these are, these are great patriots. But the people that I've been dealing with are incredible people, uh, and it, it's really a deserving name, intelligence. I've dealt with some people that aren't very intelligent, uh, having to do with intel. But this is the top people, and it, it was incredible. It was flawless, and it was very complicated. But so I do appreciate Russia, Turkey, Iraq, and Syria to an extent, because, uh, you know, we're flying into Syria. There are a lot of Syrian people with lots of guns. So we had uh, good cover for probably the most dangerous part. It would not sound to, you know, when you fly in, it doesn't sound like that would be the most dangerous when you're going into shooting nests and all of the things that happened once they broke into that pretty powerful compound. That was a very strong compound. And as I said, had tunnels. But the most dangerous part, we had great cooperation with. Yes, ma'am? Did you inform Speaker Pelosi ahead of time? No, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't do that. I wanted to make sure this kept secret. I don't want to have men lost and women. Uh, I don't want to have people lost. Do you anticipate um, inviting the special forces teams to the White House? After oh yeah, this? they'll be invited. I don't know if they'll want to have their faces shown. To be honest with you, you know, they want to. They're incredible for the country. They're not looking for public relations, but uh, they love doing what they're doing. I've seen it. First Lady was out there recently looking at what they do. She came back. She said, wow, I've never seen anything like that. Sir. The training, you know, all of the training and, and the power of the people, uh, the men and women, the strength, the physical strength, the mental strength. These are incredible people. These are very unique individuals. You mentioned whimpering. Could you hear that on your video hookup? You mentioned the whimpering of uh, Baghdadi. Uh, I don't want to talk about it, okay. but uh, he was screaming, crying, and whimpering. Uh, and he was scared out of his mind. And think of James Foley. Think of Kayla. Think of the things he did to Kayla, what he did to Foley and so many others. And for those people that say, oh, isn't this a little violent, think of how many times have you seen men I think in all cases, men, for the most part, but in terms of this, where you see the orange suits and you see the ocean and they're beheaded. Or how many of you got to see, because it was out there, the Jordanian pilot whose plane went down, they captured him, they put him in a cage and they set him on fire. And the King of Jordan actually attacked very powerfully when that happened. They've never seen a thing like that. But he set him on fire. This was al-Baghdadi. And uh, you should never, ever, hopefully, see a thing like that again. Now, uh, there'll be new people emerge, but this was the worst of, of this particular world. This was the worst. Probably, in certain ways, the smartest. He was also a coward. And he didn't want to die. But think of it. Everybody was out. And we were able to search him down and find him in the tunnel. We knew the tunnel existed, and that's where he was. And you've taken a lot of 
lot of heat for this the Syria pullout. Do you think this will change the, the standing your standing? Well, I don't have a Syria pullout. I just don't want to guard Turkey and Syria for the rest of our lives. I mean, I don't want to do it. It's very expensive. It's very dangerous. They've been fighting for centuries. I don't want to have my people, 2,000 men and women, or 1,000, or 28. We had 28 guards. I said, I don't want them there anyway. I don't want them. Now, I will secure the oil. That happens to be in a certain part. But that's tremendous money involved. I would love to. You've been uh, uh, listening to the President of the United I'll, States I'll story, uh, confirming right. the news so that had been stand. leaking out all morning that uh, U.S. Special ahead. Forces uh, have killed uh, the, the former or the now former head of ISIS, uh, Abu Bakr al Baghdadi. This has been an NBC News special report. For some of you, meet the press. We'll begin right now. For the rest of you, I'll see you a little later in the morning. We now return you to your regularly scheduled. I, w I was right for other reasons, but it turned out, on top of everything else, they had no weapons of mass destruction, because that would be a reason to go in. But they had none. But I heard recently that Iraq, over the last number of years, actually discriminates against America in oil leases. In other words, some oil companies from other countries after all we've done, uh, have an advantage in Iraq for the oil. I said, keep the oil. Give them what they need. Keep the oil. Why should we — we go in, we lose thousands of lives, spend trillions of dollars, and our companies don't even have an advantage in getting the oil leases? So I just tell you that story. That's what I heard. Haskell play a role in this? Can you talk a little bit about that? And I saw your NSC counterterrorism director out in the hallway. Was there a role with NSC yes. counterterrorism? Yes. Everybody. Gina was great. Everybody played a role. Just to, just Joe was follow, great. Gina was great. They were all great. Just to follow up, did, did your Syria pull out, did that generate the intelligence that led to this operation? No. Uh, we were looking at this. Look, as I said, Steve, I've been looking at this. I'm here almost three years. I've been looking at this for three years. They'd come in, sir, we have somebody under. I said, I don't want somebody. I want al-Baghdadi. That's the one I want. They'd say, well, we have somebody else. I said, that's great. Fine. Take them out. But I want al-Baghdadi. That's who I want. I don't want other people. And then I also wanted Hamza bin Laden, because he's a young man, around 30, looks just like his father, tall, very handsome. And he was talking bad things, just like his father. You know, if you read my book, there was a book just before the World Trade Center came down. And I don't get any credit for this, but that's okay. I never do. But here we are. Um, I wrote a book, a really very successful book. And in that book, about a year before the World Trade Center was blown up, I said, there is somebody named Osama bin Laden. You better kill him or take him out, something to that effect. He's big trouble. Now, I wasn't in government. I was building buildings and doing what I did. But I always found it fascinating. But I saw this man, tall, handsome, very charismatic, making horrible statements about wanting to destroy our country. And I'm writing a book. I think I wrote 12 books. All did very well. And I'm writing a book. World Trade Center had not come down. I think it was about, if you check, it was about a year before the World Trade Center came down. And I'm saying to people, take out Osama bin Laden, that nobody ever heard of. Nobody ever heard of. I mean, al-Baghdadi, everybody hears because he's built this monster for a long time. But nobody ever heard of Osama bin Laden until, really, the World Trade Center. But about a year, you'll have to check it, a year, year and a half before the World Trade Center came down, the book came out. I was talking about Osama bin Laden. I said, you have to kill him. You have to take him out. Nobody listened to me. And to this day, I get people coming up to me. They said, you know what? One of the most amazing things I've ever seen about you is that you predicted that Osama bin Laden had to be killed before he knocked down the World Trade Center. It's true. Now, most of the press doesn't want to write that, but, you know, but it is true. If you go back, look at my book. I think it was The America We Deserve. Uh, I, I made a prediction, and I, I 
Let's put it this way. If they would have listened to me, uh, a lot of things would have been different. Could you talk about some of the difficult decisions you had along the way here uh, in this operation? Anything that weighed on you or that you had to... Well, just death. I mean, you know, I'm sending a large number of brilliant fighters. These are the greatest fighters in the world. Uh, I'd rather let the generals tell you, but a large number. We had eight helicopters, and we had many other ships and planes. Uh, it was a large group, and again, this is a large group heading over very, very strong firepower areas where that was decision one. Will they make it? And they made it. Uh, but they took fire, but they made it. They didn't take — we don't believe, again, it was nation fire. We believe it was individual group fire or gang fire, as they call it. So they made it. Uh, so that was a big relief. But then they went in. They blasted their way in. You've heard. They blasted their way in so quickly. It was incredible, because this building was pr quite powerful, strong. They blasted their way in, and then uh, all hell broke loose. It's incredible that nobody was killed or hurt. We had nobody even hurt. And that's why the dog was so great. We actually had a robot to go in the tunnel, but we didn't get it because we were tracking him very closely. But we had a robot just in case, because we were afraid he had a suicide vest on. And if you get close to him and he blows it up, you're going to die. You're going to die. He had a very powerful suicide vest. Did you have to make any decisions in the moment while troops were on the ground? No, they had it just incredible. We were getting full reports on literally a minute-by-minute -minute basis. Sir, we just broke in. Sir, the wall is down. Sir, you know, we've captured. Sir, two people are coming out right now, hands up, fighters. Uh, then the, the 11 children out. Uh, numerous people were dead within the building that they killed. Uh, then uh, it turned out they, they gave us a report. Sir, there's only one person in the building. We are sure he's in the tunnel trying to escape, but it's a dead-end tunnel. And it was brutal, but it was over. And as I said, when he blew himself up, the tunnel collapsed on top of him, on top of everything. And his children, I mean, so he led his three children to death. So, you know. In the, in the tunnel, that's when um, the robot followed him into? That's why no The robot died. was set to, but we didn't uh, hook it up because we were too — they were moving too fast. We were moving fast. We weren't 100 percent sure about the tunnel being dead-ended. It's possible that there could have been an escape patch somewhere along that we didn't know about. So we moved very, very quickly. I mean, these people, they were moving. They were chasing, yeah. They were chasing. But again, because the suicide vest, you can't get too close. Uh, again, one of the reasons with the wives is if they have a suicide vest, you know, you have to be very, very careful. These vests are brutal, brutal, and they go for a long distance. Yes, please. Um, have you spoken or will you speak to the families, like the Foley family? I'm calling the families now. It will be a pleasure to do that. The Foley family, who I know, uh, will be calling Kayla's family. Uh, what, what he did to her was incredible. It's a well-known story, and I'm not going to say it, but you know that. He kept her in captivity for a long period of time. He kept her in his captivity, his personal captivity. She was a beautiful woman, beautiful young woman. Helped people. She was there to help people. And uh, he saw her, and he thought she was beautiful. And he brought her into captivity for a long period of time, and then he killed her. He was an animal, and he was a gutless animal. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Very great day for our country.